everything that they have been given. I mean, they had this. It's kind of like having uh, the world on a string on a downhill pull. They had everything going for them. He said, that's my kinsmen. That's Israel. Whose are the fathers? So he thinks about all those great Old Testament characters beginning with Abraham that they're descended from. Whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. In other words, Christ came from the same fathers in his earthly walk as his kinsmen and as Paul. We're all family is Paul's thoughts. And, and I'm torn up by the fact that though I preach the gospel and I go to the Gentiles and the Jews that are scattered abroad, my people are still separated from God and don't know it. Don't know it. That, that should give us, you know, a moment of wondering about our situation. We know, but some of our loved ones don't know. Some people we know don't know, but we know. Remember, Paul started out this book by saying, I'm under obligation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so he, he knows, but his people are separated. But it is not as though, it's not as though the word of God has failed. There's been no failure in the word of God. It's been going forth. For they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Now you need to take a moment to think about that. That's like saying not everybody is an American just because they were born here. He's saying they may have been born into the Jewish family. They may have been raised in that, but they're not really Israel. That's just like if you're a traitor to the USA, you're not really. Now you may have a citizen, you may have be called a citizen, you may think you're a citizen, but you're really not or not. You're flying under a different flag and you're not. And so that's what he's He's comparing them to. But the word of God does not fail. Neither are they all children because they're Abraham's descendants. But through Isaac, your descendants will be named. I'm going to, have to talk about that in just a moment. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God. Then... Old Testament, New Testament, and now. It's not by the flesh. Hang on to that. It is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. Remember, um, helping you remember a lot in this class, hopefully. Genesis chapter 12, where Abraham begins his journeys. And God tells him, I'm going to bless you and you're going to be the father of many nations and the world's going to be blessed through your descendant, which is Jesus. And so he's saying, everybody is not going to be really descended from Abraham, though physically they are. Physical descendants of Abraham is that's not going to automatically punch their ticket into glory. It, because, he says, through Isaac, your descendants will be named. Well, did Abraham have any other children? He did, didn't he? What was one of them's name? Ishmael. What group of people in the world today descended through Ishmael? Arab nations. At the time of Jesus, they were Arab nations. They were descended from Abraham, but they were not children of the promise. Remember that? 
how was who was Ishmael's mother? Who? Who was Isaac's mother? Hmm? Rebecca. So we had two sons to Abraham. Remember that song we sing up here? I like to kill myself one time in vacation Bible school. Father Abraham. Remember that? You're throwing your legs all up to this stuff. And, and I had a gorilla suit on and I was about to die. <laughs> if you can imagine that. But we sing the song, Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. Well, Abraham had a bunch of sons. Do you know that after Sarah died, Abraham had another wife? And it, I think he had six sons by Keturah. And so he had a lot of sons. Then those sons had a lot of sons, and those other ones did too, and so it just kept rolling. So descended from Abraham would be millions of people. But only through Isaac would, would to be the seed line that's going to bring us to Christ. And so that's what Paul's talking about here. For this word of promise... That is not the children of the flesh who are children of God. I'm back in verse 8. But the children of the promise are regarded as, as, as descendants. For this is the word of promise at this time. I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but there was Rebekah also. Whose wife was Rebekah? When she had conceived things by one man, our father Isaac. Okay? Rebekah's husband Isaac. She had two sons. In fact, they were twins. For though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything, now notice this, this is important, had not done anything good or bad in order that God's purpose, according to His choice, might stand not because of works of either the two sons, but because of Him who calls. It's God's business. It's God's business. If he chooses to say that it's going to be this son, that his seed line is going to come through, it's God's business to do that. Now, just because they both had the same mother, they had the same father, but this is the one that's going to be the person that everything descends from. That Paul's reminding them of that. Now, the Gentiles wouldn't have, had, wouldn't have really had a play in this, but... The Jewish people he's writing to certainly wouldn't. For though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, but in order that God's purpose according to his choice might stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger. Now that was backwards in a lot of societies may not be backwards in ours, but that's backwards from what was going to be in ancient times, particularly in Israel. The number one got the leader of the family position when his father passed. Not only did he get the leader of the family position, but he got the lion's share of the inheritance. And he led the family. It's like passing it on to another chief. But in this case, the, the younger is going to have the elder serving him. And that's going to cause problems. You've read the Old Testament, you know it caused problems. Um, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. Now there's a, did he actually hate him, or is he choosing one over the other? Jim? Yeah. And Isaac was a child of promise, and you don't think that doesn't have an impact on the world today? The hatred between yep. you know, Christians and Muslims, and they're going, wait, we're the firstborn. Yeah, but Isaac is the one that the Messiah is coming through. Well, see, remember that Sarah and Abraham tried to help God by her giving him her handmaid. 
And so it, it didn't change a thing. God had already made a choice. It just took 25 years to answer that promise. And they, had, they, had, they were afraid and were tired of waiting. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. So he's answering the question, is God being unjust because he's making these selections? After all, let's say this together, he is, he is, he is what? He is God. I mean, later in this we're going to talk about a king and all the power they have. We'll talk about the word sovereign. God is sovereign. If he chooses... That's the way it's going to be. In a real kingdom, an earthly kingdom, the king has total control. And whatever decision he makes, or if it's a queen she makes, it doesn't matter whether you like it or not. That's the way it's going to be. And so that's what he's saying here. The older will serve the owner. Uh, Verse 15 begins with the word for. He's answering the question, is there no injustice with God? For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So he had mercy, <clears throat> and he had to remind Moses this, I have had mercy on Israel the children of Israel. I've wiped out Pharaoh's army. Before that, I wiped out all the firstborn of Egypt. It's my call, sort of what God is saying. I am sovereign. Now, Paul is reminding us and them of this. So then, it does not depend on the man who wills you know, working our way up to ourselves, or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So, uh, remember Daniel will write that God raises up kings and removes kings. And so it was time to remove the Pharaoh. So then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. See, Pharaoh, and Moses is trying to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. God knows he's not going to let them go. Pharaoh is basically shaking his fist at God. He says, I am sovereign. And God is saying, not actually. And so God says, the text says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now that kind of scares me. In fact, it scares me a lot. So if, if I think that I can shake my fist at God and I can harden myself to where whatever you say to me doesn't bother me and I don't care what you say to me, God says to me through Pharaoh, Ron, you don't know nothing about being hardened. You're going to be cement hard. And so you look at our world in all ages. You've got people who were bad who became capital bad. You harden your heart. You think you harden it. I was reading this morning in the Old Testament about the, what's going to happen to Israel because they strayed from God and, and that goes on over and over and over throughout the Old Testament. People just are not very good at being obedient. And that's where you need a whole lot of grace. And you need a Savior that can save you. David, Jesus saves you from David. Jesus is working full time to save me from Ron and you from you because it's us. We are the problem. 
we got our own little agenda from the time we're looking for some milk till the day we're making arrangements with the undertaker to take care of us when we can't tell him what we want. We're interested in me. That little baby screams and hollers because they want one thing. What is that? Well, early on, it's just they want nutrition. They want that tummy filled. Later on, they want that frog back. Water has been taken from them. And then we grow up to be grown-ups, and we, go th we hardly ever change. So God saves us from us. I read that this morning. So it's on my mind. You will say to me then, if he does, why does he still find fault? For who resist his will? Well, so he's asking a question which he knows they're thinking. Well, if, if God is that staunch and he's, it's his and it's his alone, why does he find fault with us? You go a step farther. After all, he's the one who created us. Did he create us bad? So the answer is no. He just created a human. But a human has tendencies. We want what the human wants. At the things of the flesh. On the contrary, who are you, old man, who answers back, to God, the thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will he? Or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? I know a lot of you like to go up to our mountains or other places where they have these pottery shops and to make beautiful pottery. Forty-some uh, years ago, I stood there and... Um, one place in the mountains and watch this guy working, you know, as a potter. And uh, he grabbed old gray clay, threw it up there on that wheel, I think that's what they call it, and it's spinning around and he's got his hands all in and that stuff and he, he does some things with it and after a while it begins to take a shape and it's got, a, you know, it becomes like a vase or a vase. And I see him squeeze his hands and it, he starts to get that thing, and it got wobbly. But I looked on the shelf, and here's beautiful pottery. He decided whether he wanted to make out of that clay an ashtray, or if he wanted to make a drinking vessel. He alone will decide. And every artist is like that. They have a blank canvas, and they decide what they're going to paint on it. And so God is that artist, if you please. And so that's what I think we, we can see, he says. The potter has the right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use. What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath, and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath. See, he goes back to what he just used about making the vessels. Vessels of wrath, which he prepared for her, beforehand for glory. Even us, whom he also called just from among Jews only, but also not from just the Jews only, but also from among the Gentiles. So he says, God's called from among the Jews. He's called from among the Gentiles. Not all the Gentiles are going to be saved. They all have the right to be. Not all the Jews are going to be saved, though they have the right to be. But God has chosen people out of both classes. Now, how, how does he cho choose them, Jim? Today, by, the by the gospel. And that's how we're called. So they were called from this side, and we're called from that side, and it's in response to the Messiah, Jesus Christ, that determines whether... You're going to be in there or not. But the call goes out. We choose. So. Verse 23. And he did so. 
God made it that way in order that he might make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy which he prepared beforehand for glory. So, so we're in the pottery shop. Over here is the vessels that have been approved by the potter. And over here is the broken pieces that are going to the trash heap. Let's make sure we're on that shelf over here and respond to God's call. We don't have to. I mean, we can just go straight away from him if we choose to. Because it's, it's our choice. It's our choice to be saved or not to be saved. And that's kind of scary. Because I'm getting on up in ages. I guarantee you I've made some bad choices in my life. It's be, it might be easier for me if God had said, Ron, this is what it's going to be, and you can't do a thing about it. As long as he said, I could go with him. But you can't do a thing about it. But he's made me, and now he wants me to follow him. I have answered the cause. He's from the, not only the Jews, but the Gentiles. And he says also in Hosea, we will call those, I will call those who were not my people, my people. That would be the Gentiles. And her who was not beloved would be the beloved. That again is Gentiles. And it shall be that in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, again the Gentiles, that they shall be called the sons of the living God. Now don't you know that some of those members of that church in Rome who were Gentiles, now they're getting good news. They're getting good news. Those who were not my people are now my people. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Therefore, through the, though the number of the sons of Israel be as a sand of the sea, it is a remnant that shall be saved. Over and over in the Old Testament, it will talk about something, when they talk about numbers, like the sand of the sea. Can you imagine... Remember when you actually went to the beach with your little bucket and filled it up with sand? Wouldn't you like to be able to know just how many grains of sand are in that little bucket? And then you multiply that by all the beaches in the world. That's it's an illustration so we can understand that this is big. This is big. And he says, though they are so numerous as the sand of the sea, only a remnant. So we take our little bucket of sand and we go, maybe we bring it home. Maybe we make us a, a display or something. So just as Isaiah foretold, except the Lord of Seboeth, that's mercy, had left to us a posterity, we would have become as Sodom and would have resembled Gomorrah. In other words, we would have been destroyed. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attain righteousness, even the righteousness which is in by faith. But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law because they sought it not by faith. I'm adding that. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. Just as it is written, Brethren, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling. That's Jesus. And a rock of offense. Some were offended at him. And he who believes in him shall not be disappointed. Do we believe? Okay, here's a promise. We won't be disappointed. And we still got five minutes. Let's see if we've got any questions. Now, I'm going to have to confess to you, this was a little tougher lesson than usual. Okay? And so if you have not filled it out, maybe I gave you some things to think about. You can go home and fill it out because that's why I gave you these papers. What caused Paul's sorrow and pain in his heart? In the very beginning of the chapter. Because his relatives wouldn't believe and so they were cast out. Did that make him happy? So I said, well, you deserve it. 
No, it kills him because they didn't. What statement did Paul make that illustrates how badly he wanted his fellow Israelites saved? He said, I would die for them. I'll pay the price. Name eight blessings the physical Israelites had. I'm going to give you this one. Adoption as sons of God, Israelites. The glory of the covenants. All the covenants. Not just the Ten Commandments. The Abraham's descendants. The law was given to them by Moses at Sinai, the temple service. They, get, they were the nation that had the, the, the priesthood. The promise made to Abraham and repeated by various prophets. The, the father, Jesus, descended from the Jewish father, uh, Abraham, David, etc. And they were all Israelites. They had things going for them. Paul, uh, explain Paul's statement, for they are not all Israel that are of Israel. Just being a son of Abraham doesn't make you a true Israelite. It's got to be a faith. In Abraham's case, who was the children of the flesh and the children of the promise? Children of the flesh. They got there by physical means. Ishmael. Okay. Okay, in verse seven, the children of the promise is Isaac's descendants. Isaac's descendants. Which were reckoned for a seed? Well, Isaac and Jacob. Not Esau and Ishmael. Name the two sons of Isaac. Who was firstborn? Esau, and then there's Jacob. How's God's sovereignty seen in verses 14 through 18? Well, de define sovereign. What does the sovereign mean? Pardon? Yep. Well, well, that's right. Webster gives a brief definition saying one who undisputedly has a right to make decisions. Absolute power. That's what is absolute power. What purpose of God was um, achieved by Pharaoh hardening his heart? God was glorified in the victories. Uh, in verse 22 through 23, Paul speaks of vessels of wrath and vessels of mercy. Who are what who are, what could each be? Or who could... Vessels of wrath, who would that be? I mean, think about the Old Testament. Let's think about there. Vessels of wrath. Who did God use to punish Israel? Well, it started out with Pharaoh. Who else did he use? Who took them away for 70 years of captivity? The Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar. Or Pharaoh, or these are people that could be vessels of wrath. God used them and then discarded them. What two groups of people will, will the saved come from? Two groups of people, Jews and Gentiles. What does Paul mean about only a remnant being saved? A remnant. A remnant of the Jews is what he's talking about. There will be some saved. For instance, when the Israelites were taken captivity by, uh, well, first they were taken in captivity by the Assyrians, the northern kingdom was. Very few of them ever returned back to Israel. And when Nebuchadnezzar took Judah and all the others from in the, that part of the nation, they took them away. They went out uh, hundreds and thousands and uh, a remnant came back. All right? And they started all over again. So in all those cases, some are saved, but some are lost. Anybody got anything saved for a close-up shop? Uh-huh. Yeah. 
Anybody that knows them? They are pitiful. And if you have, if you want to help them, that's your that's your opportunity. Well, some of that is, I mean, some of that is not really true. There's there's poor uh, people. I don't care what color they are, and I don't care what language they speak. I don't care where in the world they live. There's poor folks and rich folks. If you line them up side by side and dress them up, they look the same. But some of us are born into uh, a situation that is not good. Yeah. Well. Well, it's just like the the ones for animals. Yeah. I don't have a pet. I don't want a pet. I've lost my pet, and I don't want to do that. Go through that again. But I, I don't like the fact that some people mistreat animals. I, you know I don't like when they mistreat children's. And so, uh, but benevolence is needed around the world. Okay? So you can't be worried about if someone's taking advantage of you. If you feel like helping somebody, just help them. If you don't feel like helping anybody, then you probably need to go check with God about that. All right? So, uh, and remember, as we say over and over again from that pulpit there and have for 70-some years, we're in better shape than a whole lot of people. I saw a boat I wanted to buy when I came in this morning. There's no way in the world I can get that boat. I deserve the boat because I said, told myself, I was, you deserve that boat or one like it. But between you and me and Ann, there ain't going to be any boat in my future. Unless Kate survives one. <laughs>